You better watch out. You better not cry. You better hold your hands up high because Santa has a gun and is robbing the place. In 1927, a Texas town was shaken up at Christmas when St. Nick and friends pulled a heist on the local bank. A manhunt ensued, and the local citizens ensured some form of justice was finally served, no matter the cost. This week's episode is The Santa Claus Bank Robbery. Up, bump in the night, your heart fills with dread. Probably a murderer who wants you dead. It could be a ghost, a demon, or worse. Perhaps you're the victim of a witch's curse. It's hopeless, you're doomed. You'd call a priest if you could. You'd rather just listen to who? Sinisterhood. I'm gonna kill you. All I think of when I think of Cisco is the thong song <laughs> but now i got now i got a new memory of cisco oh that's uh they have a cisco fest every year and everyone wears thongs in cisco texas oh um dumps like a truck 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 mm-hmm. that's a good that's the song that man, man it'll get a, it'll bring the house down that's one that, when did that come out Gosh. oh man i want to say when i was in high school probably late 90s early 2000s yeah because i was in early years of college so that tracks Mm-hmm. And it was like TRL days. Yes, yes, yes. If you, oh, if we had a party today, God, I wish, and put that on, <laughs> it would bring the house down. Oh, people get so excited. Because <laughs> it's one that everyone knows, but you haven't heard in forever. So, mm-hmm. But you immediately are like, let me see that. Yeah. And there's always a person at karaoke who sings it that they they know the verses, so they're proud of themselves, but they forget the repetitive nature of the chorus. <laughs> and a good karaoke song can't be too, you know, it need, they need to cut that down. Yeah. And a good karaoke jockey will fade you out before you have to say, thong, 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 like for 10 minutes. <laughs> That's what seems yeah. like an hour. <laughs> what karaoke songs, when they're, whenever you're singing one, and then there's like a long guitar break, it's, is there anything more awkward than standing on that stage and waiting for that to be over with? Didn't you and I, on our Fleetwood Mac, you were like, well, I didn't realize this was like a 15-minute solo. I can't remember what Fleetwood Mac song it was. It was, it was a deep cut. It wasn't something... I think Laura oh. Goff was like, y'all need to sing this. And we had been imbibing, and it sounded yeah, like a great couple. time. That was it a, was the still Christmas good. party. Yeah. It was, still, it was still fun, but there was a... Uh, was it yeah. Chains? Oh, was it The Chain? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Jinx. <laughs> yeah, it's a great song. That's not a deep cut, but it was. it's a great song, but it, it does get very repetitive at some mm-hmm. point, and we yeah. neglected to remember that at the time. But it's got such a... Yeah. It's got a good, like... Yeah. It's a that build-up is great, too. Oh, Damn. yeah. God. We killed it still. We did. Even with the, even with the lull of the instrumental. <laughs> well, what would Santa Claus's... Um, karaoke song be you think um this santa claus would be bitch but i have my money <laughs> i think because that should be all a little Santa's, different i think <laughs> bitch, he wants to get my paid cookies. back yeah <laughs> yes. oh yeah he's this santa was a tough a little tough santa mm-hmm. although i santa did not come but the u.s postal service has been very busy being our personal Santa, delivering us such beautiful fan mail. That is very true. Yes. Uh, nice segue, by the way. I was like, where is she going with this? I, I <laughs> caught up office. halfway through. That's true. Yes. Um, we have received so many. I don't even. They're like. I, I'm so blown away by people's creativity sometimes. Seriously. You forget because we all live in this bubble right now, like the talent of people out there. And then yeah. when it's shared with us, it's such a wonderful surprise. I love it. And then I, I stop there. I go on a walk every day through my neighborhood. That's like three miles. And I just, I wonder if people, I'm reasonably dressed in athletic clothes, but I always wonder if people are like, there's just a lady in our, like, I don't really look like an athlete. So I could just be like a door to door salesman. 
And if I, especially if I stop at the post office and I just walk around with a manila envelope or a padded envelope in my hand, I probably look like I stole it off someone's porch. <laughs> but I'm always just, it, it's like gives me time to reflect and be super grateful and like carry these like nice little gifts back to the studio where they have found their home. Yes. We are specifically talking about, we got some custom made earrings, keychains, a bracelet. Mm-hmm. Yes. From Miranda. Uh, her Etsy and Instagram is at Mirandy Pants Studio. One thing that I love about this the most, and that mm-hmm. Tommy loved too, she rescues pigs. It's amazing. And her company is called Snout and Proud Pig Rescue. And the and proceeds from her gifts go to the, the piggies. Her business card has a included- very cute piggy on it. Yeah, the little piggy corn in there. It makes you really feel like, you know, you're contributing. And the bunny man earrings she made us have a rabbit and like a red blood Mm -hmm. drop, kind of a bead, and then an axe, which where do you even get an axe to put on earrings? I don't know. She found it, and she made me some very cute acrylic pig earrings. She went all out. Some Ouija board, Mm -hmm. keychains, lots of awesome stuff. We also got some new masks. Can can never have too many masks. Not these days. And I'm always looking for interesting ones that... Mm -hmm. People will be like, oh, I like your mask. That's the new thing. The mm-hmm. other day I was wearing my sloth mask and somebody was like, oh, I really like your mask. Danielle M. Myers, attorney at law from Portland, Oregon, sent us RBG masks and she made a tiny yeah. one for Ella. <laughs> it's so little and cute. <laughs> I love it. So sweet. Thank you. Oh, we also got stickers and magnets from Mel from Australia, Kitten Pants Studio on Etsy. And at Mrs. Underscore Kitten Pants on Instagram. These were awesome. They were like League of Their Own and Golden Girls and Kate McKinnon and very much our shit. And I love that it came all the way from Australia, yeah. which it, they had it had been ripped open by customs. And one of the postcards is a peach emoji that looks like an ass. And it nice. says just peachy. And I'm like, some lovely customs agent <laughs> had to open it up and be like, what? first of all, what sinisterhood? And second of all, <laughs> There's an ass postcard in there. All right. And then they just then they taped it up say, and gave it back. It's good to go. Yeah. And then <laughs> uh, we have a new addition to the studio. Yes. I love it. Bitching plus stitching on Instagram. Kennedy and Instagram and Etsy made a cross stitch with a beautiful antique frame that says the dick will drag you down. And it has taken its rightful place next to our Beyonce candle and our Jersey Devil figurine and all of our, our cute stuff in the studio that we have because... I mean, it's just such. It, it lo- I love it because it looks so elegant. The frame is very so- ornate, as it should be dick. around such a classy quote. <laughs> it's very classy. <laughs> so we appreciate it. Thank you so much. And that came all the way from Canada. Again, it's been opened by Customs. It says, I "What is inside? That. Embroidery." <laughs> and then Customs reads, "The dick will drag you oh, down." They're like, hey, yep. <laughs> the dick will drag you down, eh? <laughs> <laughs> so that that's the best part if you're going to send us something from out of the country make it filthy yeah. make, give the customs inspector something fun to look at uh, you know what they probably appreciate it. they probably showed it around so. it was a little treat for them in their day broke up the monotony well thank you everybody so much it's thank so you, sweet of you. you guys when y'all do stuff like that and really makes our days it does so this week we're talking about a robbery that happened in Cisco which is Probably four hours from here, would you say? Four it's or five about hours? 100, 150 miles from oh, us. Oh, some so way we'll, off. We'll closer to two and a half or so. Yeah. And it's, uh, I did not know about this. And surprisingly, it's like the most infamous bank robbery in Texas ensued the largest manhunt the state's ever seen. But somehow I had never heard about it. And especially we get sent a lot of crimes that have weird aspects to them. And not only is this Texas and legendary, but he's the Santa costume. So, I mean, I don't know how this slipped through our cracks, but we started looking for Christmas themed crimes, Mm -hmm. uh, digging through the old Texas archives. And I literally went on newspapers.com and typed in crime Christmas and then narrowed down the search. Yeah, there we go. This will come out. So we're recording a bit early right now. So yes. we're preparing for the arrival of the babe. The baby. So we are, um, I think this will come out two weeks after we're actually recording it. This will come out on the 23rd, right? I believe that's right. Yes. Festivus. So Festivus, yes. So um, Happy Festivus. So Merry Christmas Eve Eve to all mm-hmm. that are li- listening. Happy Festivus. Happy, I don't know when Hanukkah starts. 
That's my bad. Uh, the t- December 10th. Uh, I just saw it in my well, planner. So it will have been already over by then. But I hope it was great. Yes, I hope you had eight crazy nights and they were amazing. Well, let's get into it. Cisco, Texas was a small town of about 8,000 people in 1927. Texas's first female governor, Ma Ferguson, had granted hundreds of pardons just before leaving office in January of that year. Among those pardoned was 24-year-old Marshall Ratliff, described by the Fort Worth Telegram as a tall, sinewy man with close-cropped, dirty blonde hair and a history of troublemaking. Ratliff had recently been convicted for robbing a bank in Valera, Texas, with his brother Lee. However, with the pardon, the two men only served a year of their sentence. Ratliff was now out and looking for a way to get rich. Naturally, he concocted a scheme to rob the local bank in Cisco. Went down a Ma Ferguson rabbit hole because I did not know much about her. What a great name. And her husband had been governor, and then she became governor, and her platform was basically, and I think he was ousted on corruption, and her platform was, I'm just going to do what my husband says, so it's like you're voting for him. Well, it was yeah, a different yikes. time back then. <laughs> it was the 20s. It was the 20s. But yeah, she let she let, let a lot of people loose. Mm, yeah, at her and husband's the, request. Probably, yeah. And the Ratliff brothers were definitely uh, troublemakers. Mm-hmm. Initially, Ratliff and Lee planned on robbing the bank together. But Lee had already been arrested again, throwing a monkey wrench in the criminal family affair. Undeterred. Ratliff recruited 32-year-old Henry Helms, who, like Ratliff, had also been convicted and pardoned by Governor Ferguson. Next, they got 22-year-old Robert Hill, who had previously been arrested for burglary. Finally, they recruited 33-year-old Louis Davis, a relative of Helms, who had a clean record, but was down on his luck after losing his job of six years just weeks before Christmas. Yeah, Helms was a family man, husband, kids, and the glass factory job just booted him right before Christmas. Davis, you mean? I'm sorry, yeah. Lewis Davis, yes. Yeah, and what's sad is he got roped in at the last minute. They had tapped another guy who had a record to be the safe cracker for their whole heist, but he came down mm-hmm. with the flu a few days before and had to bail, which those things, it's like one of those things, sliding mm-hmm. doors small moment. Little- yeah, like how that must have changed his life. But this poor guy, as we'll see, gets the worst of it. And he was the only one that was just like, I'm just trying to get some money for some presents for my family. And I'm pretty sure they told him it'll be super easy. It's not going to be a violent job, uh, Mm -hmm. as they always say. Yes. And his one request was, I just don't want there to be any shooting. Well, (sighs) yikes. That Christmas wish did not come true. Before being tracked down for the Valera bank robbery, Ratliff had lived in Cisco. Years prior, his mother had also run a cafe in the small town. Concerned he would be recognized during his heist, Ratliff decided he needed a disguise and borrowed a Santa suit from Miss Midge Tellett, his boarding housekeeper in Wichita Falls, a city roughly 200 miles from Cisco, where he was residing at the time. Ratliff and his crew then stole a Buick from their home base and headed to Cisco for the job. The sad thing is Midge Tellett made that Santa suit. She hand sewed it for her husband to wear at Christmas. Mm. And this guy's like, let me just borrow it for a day. (laughs) I'll bring it back. I don't think she got it back. Yeah. I don't think. mm -mm. (laughs) The men headed toward the bank around 1245 p.m. on December 23rd, 1927. The weather was nice, so the streets were crowded with holiday shoppers. Ratliff was led out of the car a few blocks from the bank, his Santa suit concealing the many guns he had brought along for the job. As Helms, Hill, and Davis drove to the alley adjacent to the bank, kids rushed toward Ratliff, excited to tell Santa their Christmas wishes. When one onlooker asked Santa if he represented the nearby department store, the Fort Worth Star-Telegram reported Santa curtly replied, I don't represent a store. You'll find out soon enough who I represent. That's red flag number one, that this (laughs) is a Santa... (laughs) That maybe we don't want to fuck with. <laughs> He's aggressive as shit. You pull your kid away from that and you're like, I don't think that's the you're real like, Santa. You're like, first of all, why did Santa get let out of a Buick with three very shady looking men who now are like in the alley of this bank? Slow rolling. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think uh, all they, the former Star Telegram, basically, they did this big spread on it um, in the 80s, kind of like on one of the anniversaries. Mm-hmm. And they said the weather really screwed them. 
Because if it had been bad weather, he would have just kind of slipped in the bank and it probably wouldn't have been as crowded. But since it was like, I mean, it was in Dallas today. It's, you know, mid-December. It was 73 today. Yeah, it's like in the 70s, it's sunny, it's nice, everybody's out. And so you're going to attract attention Mm -hmm. if it's Christmas, the day before Christmas Eve. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. All the kids are trying to hug you and you're like, I got to rifle in there stop <laughs> they're like santa is that a gun or are you happy to see me <laughs> neither <laughs> yeah as ratliff made his way toward the alley to meet up with the others a six-year-old francis blazingame begged her mom to take her to meet santa mrs blazingame obliged and led her daughter into the bank shortly after santa and the other men entered happy to see what he assumed was jolly saint nicholas One of the bank employees paused his conversation with a customer to say, Hello, Santa. Santa, however, was not interested in pleasantries. Yeah, Santa's grunting and (laughs) rifling through his belly for a handgun. The accomplices drew their guns, forcing bank patrons and employees to the ground. Helms held a gun on a bank teller, demanding, Stick him up, big boy, according to the Fort Worth Star-Telegram. Ratliff then took a teller and two customers into a back room to search them for weapons. He found none, but he took the bank's automatic pistol from the teller's desk and stuffed it alongside the others in his Santa suit. It's a baller teller, just a gun on your desk. Dude, this was literally the wild, wild west back then. Yeah, it was tough times working at a bank. Mm Mm-hmm. In the commotion, Mrs. Blazingame grabbed Francis and headed for the bank's side door. Despite the criminals yelling at her to stop or they would shoot, she shoved Francis into the alley, ran out behind her daughter, and screaming for all to hear, They're robbing the First National Bank! According to the Fort Worth Star-Telegram, one of the locals within earshot was Police Chief Bit Bedford. Armed with a riot gun and two officers for backup, Chief Bedford ran for the bank. The description of Chief Bedford Bedford was that he was a huge guy, like 6'5", 250, like huge dude, like well-known to just... He doesn't fuck around. Mm -mm. And I'm pretty sure he's the one. Is it him or the other one that ends up uh, joining the search that had taken in Ratliff for the other bank robbery? It may have been the other guy, but Uh, they're all kind of connected in a one because, well, as we'll see, Chief Bedford doesn't make it that No, the previous bank robbery, the Valero one. Oh, the Valero one. Uh, He knew him and he he was a troublemaker in town. So I think he would have known. So. But yeah, they said Chief Bedford, I believe a riot gun's not even a uh, deadly gun. It's like a rubber bullet mm-hmm. gun. And he was just like, I'm going to go stop him. <laughs> he was ready. It's interesting they had those back then. Who knew? Yeah. <laughs> not me. I did not. I had to look it up. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, Santa had forced a bank teller to open the vault and had begun filling his sack marked Idaho potatoes with $12,000 in cash and $150,000 in non-negotiable security papers a sum equaling over $2 million in today's money. Helms, Hill, and Davis had been busy rounding up the hostages and moving them into the back room. Among them were two young girls, 12-year-old Laverne Comer and 10-year-old Emma Mae Robertson, who had been at the bank that day to check the balance of their savings accounts. Like you said again, the the wrong place, wrong time. You know, your life takes a Mm -hmm. turn. Well, I'll go to the bank today versus going the day before. These sweet little girls that have a savings account at 10 and 12 just want to see how much their pennies are accruing. Exactly. And then (laughs) this happens. I know. And I I just imagine them being like, oh, Santa's at the bank and how quickly your emotions turn. Plus, I think there are several ways to tell if somebody is not a real Santa. One. Their coat is not filled with a belly that shakes like a bowl full of jelly, but instead a bunch of guns. Yeah, shaped like um, a bunch of armor is under <laughs> Just there. Looks like whenever, you know, the villains in a movie open up their mm-hmm. cabinet, and they have guns all hanging up. And number two, the bag, I feel like Santa's bag is traditionally red velvet with like gold yeah. cords. Red, not maroon. Idaho, yep. Not Idaho not potatoes. A, not a burlap Idaho potato sack. <laughs> not a dirty sack. I don't think it is. Also, what a different time to just drop your 10-year-old off at the bank so she can check her savings account while the Go parents on. are, I don't know, anywhere else. Shopping off in the off in the city wondering, oh, look, Santa's visiting the bank. Mm-hmm. The girls will love that. Different times. Emerging from the vault, Ratliff saw figures out the front windows of the bank and fired a shot. Police returned fire and all hell broke loose. But the police weren't the only ones shooting. In the mid-1920s, bank robberies were so commonplace in small Texas towns, with holdups happening three or four times per day, 
that the Texas Bankers Association offered a $5,000 bounty for anyone brave and bold enough to shoot a bank robber in action. This became known as the Dead Robber Award, according to Texas Monthly, with dead being the operative word. The 5K would only be awarded if the robber was killed. But not one cent for a hundred live ones. Naturally, when rumblings of a robbery in progress at the First National Bank spilled into the streets, eager citizens rushed down there and began firing into the building. You just have a vigilante <laughs> mob. And in, a very encouraged holding a carrot in front of their vigilante mob selves. You, Seriously. You say... Hey, five grand back in, I mean, five grand now is a lot. Back then? Mm Mm-hmm. Yes, you're going to get a bunch of people down there with guns shooting. (laughs) It sounds like a terrible idea. Plus, if it was, you know, the old towns, they probably already had guns on them. So it's not like they had to run home and get a gun and run back. They They just pulled out with They just walked walked across the street to the bank. Knowing the game was up, the robbers led the 16 hostages, including the young girls, out into the alleyway and toward their getaway car. In the alley, more gunfire erupted, injuring several innocent people, including the bank's president, Alex Spears. Of the 16 hostages, you you are kind of when you research it, it'll be like, you know, this person and this person walked out, but then they took off running. So the bank robbers couldn't hold on to any of their hostages. They clearly, as threatening as it is to have a gun on them, the hostages with all the melee that was going on around them. Every single one of them just made a break for yeah. it. It would say they tried to use her as a human shield, and she elbowed him in the face and ran off. <laughs> it's just like every person because name back after then, name. Everybody had a, a GD gun. That's true. So and it's not even that weird that like, and with robberies happening three or four times per God, day. Don't go to the bank. Keep your shit in the ca- <laughs> coffee can in the attic. Yes. Why would you even be at the bank? Number no. one, with when I mean that's you're just. I'm not a betting woman, but if I was, I sure as shit would be going to the bank. But yeah, I think back then it's like uh, people were more badasses and hard because you had to be. Mm hmm. They were everybody was ready on the uh-huh. uh, ready to shoot them a bank robber. Also, on some level, are you kind of like, this is just Santa. Like, even <laughs> though he has a gun and he's <laughs> robbing the bank, can you really be that threatened when he's wearing a beard and a Santa suit and, you know, he looks like Santa? Maybe they were underestimating him. He was pretty, he was uh, tenacious. While most of the hostages escaped, Laverne Comer and Emma Mae Robertson weren't so lucky. The two young girls were forced into the getaway car amidst the continued shootout. During the chaos, the first casualties would occur. Police Chief Bedford and Deputy George Carmichael were critically injured, later succumbing to their injuries. Ratliff and Davis were also shot, with Davis being severely injured. Yeah, it was such a, I mean, there was guns go, or bullets flying. Mm-hmm. And they said when Helms and um, Davis initially got into the car, that Helms was behind the wheel and that a restaurateur from around the block brought a shotgun from his restaurant. He was, he's not a person, he's not a, not a cop. No. And he brought a shotgun and put it in the driver's side window, put it up to his head and did not know how to unhook the safety And was like trying to click the gun and luckily they were able to drive off. But it was like that where the the brazen citizens were just walking up and were just ready to shoot a man in the face. Because they've been told they'll get five grand if they do this. Five grand right before Christmas is going to go a long way in your restaurant. That's true. It's like the purge. People were just (laughs) taking the law in their own hands. It was lawless. I mean, the majority of the people shooting at this bank were not police. No, statistically, there were three cops, one of whom had a fake gun. <laughs> so everybody else was just yeah. bystanders yeah. looking for their, their money. And here it is with Davis, the one guy who didn't want any shooting. He's just mm-hmm. there because he's down on his luck. And now he's hanging on by a thread of all Yeah, he of them. got the worst of it. Mm-hmm. With the criminals' plan quickly unraveling, they discovered another error they had made. They had forgotten to fill up the Buick with gas. Then... Before they could speed away with what little they had in the tank, a citizen shot out the car's back tire. The battered Buick then took off, an angry mob of citizens close behind. I've I've gotten in the car in the morning and turned it on and it goes ding and you're just enough time to get to work Mm -hmm. and you're like, fuck. But that's work. That's an everyday work. I was not planning a heist. Yeah, they did not plan well. There's a checklist when you're going to rob a (laughs) bank that you should have. (laughs) Yes. And make sure car getaway car is filled with gas is number one, maybe. Take I my gun, so. maybe, is number one. <laughs> Take my t- number two, 
Make sure your car is filled with gas. It's yes. starting to get a little reminiscent of the Sun Gym Gang. Yes, where they're like, it's not that hard. Let's just do it. Yeah. Let's do the crime right now. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's hard. It's, it's sometimes doing crime is hard. What they didn't take into consideration was the citizens of Cisco were on one that day. And they were <laughs> not going to let this rest. They were they all at the it. ready. Yes. At the outskirts of town, the gang chose to ditch their bus to getaway car and steal another. As 14-year-old Woody Harris drove down the road in the family's Oldsmobile, he was surprised to see a wounded Santa beside a broken-down Buick flagging him down. When the young teen pulled over, he was even more shocked when Santa brandished a gun, ousting the family from the vehicle. Young Woody was a quick thinker, though, and snagged the keys before getting out, making the car immobile. They said he was driving with his parents and his grandma. And 14 you said, Look years at old. Santa. 14 years old, though. <laughs> yes. Well, back again, it was a different time. No, was a I don't girl. think they had the DMV or no. requirements on how. I think you could be eight years old and drive a car down to the bank, probably. Uh, pretty sure if your feet can reach the pedals, that's you can true. take the Oldsmobile down and check your savings balance. Man, that's hilarious, though, that. Three other adults, at least, were in this car with them. They're like, just let Woody drive. <laughs> He's got it. Let him practice. Yeah. Uh, but I do like that it's the ultimate teenage troll move of like, yeah, I'll give you my car, but I'm taking the keys. <laughs> yeah. Good for him. <laughs> yes. And they just took off running. He took the keys and they all took off and it was such a commotion that we'll see what happens. Mm. <laughs> the clueless gang quickly transferred the wounded Davis, who was now unconscious, and the sack of loot into the new car. As the posse from town grew closer, more gunfire erupted, this time hitting Hill. When the new car wouldn't start, the crew fled back to the Buick, leaving behind Davis, and unbeknownst to them, the money. When the vigilantes caught up with the car, they discovered Davis and the loot. Satisfied they had recovered the bank's money, they gave up their pursuit of Santa and the others. Another thing on the checklist, as you run away... <laughs> Don't leave $2 million behind. The whole reason you did this, the whole reason you went to all of this trouble, you have just abandoned. Maybe instead of a, a potato sack, you bring a backpack. <laughs> Something that's attached <laughs> Something to Something more manageable. Can't, yeah. Can't leave it behind. And they're just driving down the road. Have you ever, I'm sure you've had flat tires. It's very hard to drive on them. <laughs> oh, yeah. Clunking down the road. It's also hard. an they're old unwieldy. Buick. Yeah. And it's those things are like boats and they those, there's probably no power steering. It's just yeah. like I can't imagine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're just glug, 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 glug. And, and these poor kids, 10 and 12 years old are like, "Oh, we're with the dumbest kidnappers <laughs> ever." So, we're not going to get murdered, but we might die due to yeah. negligence yeah. because they're just terrible. <laughs> Eventually, the men ditched the Buick and the child hostages near a farm, warning the girls to hide their eyes while they made their getaway. The bandits then ran into the brush, but not before the girls saw where they went. When officers arrived, the girls told them which way the crooks had gone and identified Santa as Marshal Ratliff. This is the first in a string of many hostages that just finger them right away. <laughs> oh, He yikes. took his Santa outfit off. That's a and choice, the... choice word. <laughs> you know what I mean. I know. In the old 20s way. They fingered. Yeah, yes. I always found that word in, used in that context to be unsettling. <laughs> well, yeah, it sounds dirty. <laughs> it's one of those words that you're just like, If you oh, say, yikes. the children fingered the Santa <laughs> bandit, it sounds terrible. But apparently he said, close your eyes, and then took off the Santa outfit, and then the, the littlest girl, Emma, just opened her eyes and looked right yeah. at him. I, I mean, like, again, oh, no, your face. they're not the smartest. A Patreon pointed out how I, in the last episode, said... You blew your load on that whole suit. And I'm <laughs> like, right. sometimes we just say things and we don't realize until listening back, like, oh, yeah, that made it sound like Bigfoot jizzed all over us. Yes. <laughs> like, not you blew your wad, but I don't think wad is wad like is, wad of cash. Yeah. Not better. It's and not wad better. could also be load, which yeah, could also be better. what we're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. If someone blew their load on a Bigfoot suit and fingered Santa, <laughs> it is a real different Christmas. That is a different. movie that needs to be made. Stat. <laughs> probably. Ask Tommy. It's probably on the internet already. <laughs> oh, yeah. For sure. Hanging on by a thread, Davis was taken to a Fort Worth hospital. When he came to, he refused to snitch. However, after being given a bad prognosis by doctors, he told police everything before succumbing to his injuries. In addition to Davis's death and two police officers dying, 
Five bystanders had also been injured in the mayhem. The bank itself was also riddled with more than 200 bullet holes. Not that crime ever pays, but it's especially sad in a situation like this where it's not like they made off with this great heist. They didn't even keep the loot. Mm -hmm. They've killed all these people. They've made this huge mess. They've traumatized these kids. And they're just, they're leaving a trail of horrific destruction in their wake. And, and they're kind of idiots. For what? Yeah, they're idiots. For what? There's no, yeah. It's like pointless. Yeah. 200 bullet holes. That's Mm-mm. what's also so jaw-dropping about this whole thing is the citizens are all shooting. Yes. They realize other citizens, including children, are in this bank that they're just blindly Correct. shooting into. Two hundred, And from what I read, a lot of the newspapers were like, 200 is a, a low estimate. Like, what are you doing? You're, yeah, you're going to shoot your own. Well, and I don't understand. So, like, there's three bank robbers and say there's 30 citizens. Again, probably conservative estimate because once the lady's running through the street screaming, they're robbing the bank. You know, it's like a swarm. And they're all shooting at the bank robbers. I, perhaps they're inspired by justice. But if they're inspired by the five grand... Even if all three bank robbers mm. get shot dead, what are you going to divide 15000 by everybody that yeah. was in the crowd? Like, how do you know who mm-hmm. shot what? Yeah, no, no, no one would know who, who that goes to. Well, that's not fair to distribute the death money. <laughs> <laughs> As the man had continued over the next six days, Christmas came and went. For many children, having witnessed Santa hold up the local bank had proven confusing. While attending a Christmas Eve service at a church in Eastland, one little boy seemed to speak for everyone when Jolly Santa strolled into the church. Seeing the man in the red suit, the boy timidly asked, Santa Claus, why did you rob that bank? According to Texas Escapes. That is pretty sad. <laughs> this, yeah, Christmas was a lot different that year with parents having to explain, I don't want to set out cookies for Santa. <laughs> no. What if he doesn't like him and he comes to my room and He's shoots got a gun. me? <laughs> Santa Claus killed the police chief. I'm scared. <laughs> That's a, a much, you know, you hear about the Santas in other countries that they like beat you with reeds or put you mm-hmm. in a burlap sack. This is the most threatening, I think, child behavior Santa of if you're good, you know, Santa will bring you a toy. If you're bad, he is an actual murderer. He is going to kidnap you and drive you across the state of Texas. <laughs> Don't worry. There will be no gas and a tire will be flat. So you will be released in a field. <laughs> Meanwhile, Bad Santa and his crew of criminal elves continued to elude authorities as officers from 10 counties searched for them. Ratliff, badly bleeding from his injuries, waited in the woods while Helms and Hill stole a farmer's car and kidnapped his son before picking up Ratliff and heading into town to steal yet another car. When they let the farmer's son go, he immediately went to the police who took off after the men. Again, I'm not here to tell you that you should kill your witnesses, but as soon as they let these people go, let him go far away from town. Why they even basically, kidnap him in the first place? What's they the said point? they wanted to take him for, quote, insurance. Yeah. Leave him. Just And take that's the why car. they took the girls, too, because they thought, oh, nobody's going to shoot at us if we've got these two young girls. Wrong. Very wrong. wrong. No nope. one gave a shit. But yeah, they're also... Why you got to keep stealing so many cars? Just stay in one car. <laughs> Pick a good one and stick with it. And they if they wouldn't have taken the sun, they could have just, instead of going into town and trying to steal another car, just drive off in the truck. Yeah. But they were not good planners. And poor Ratliff, I say poor, I mean, he's obviously shot people in his murder, but he was got shot in the jaw. Mm. And that just sounds so blech to that me. That Santa That's so, beard is going to go red. He's going to be a ginger real quick. <laughs> ginger Santa. He's all stuck to his face. Mm-hmm. After several more stolen cars and firefights with the authorities, Ratliff, Helms, and Hill were ambushed by Sheriff Foster of Young County as they attempted to cross the Brazos River near South Bend. Texas Ranger Cy Bradford managed to shoot all three men. While Helms and Hill managed to escape into the woods, Ratliff fell to the ground and Santa was finally captured. Three days later, Helms and Hill were also taken into custody in Graham, Texas, The two men were wounded, starving, and went without a fight. All three men were booked into the Eastland County Jail, ending the largest manhunt the state of Texas has ever seen. Yeah, even though it was nice on the 23rd, the weather took a turn, and it was shitty and cold and raining, and they're bleeding and hanging out in the woods. As it does in Texas, I'd like the saying, wait five minutes if you don't like the weather. 
Mm-hmm. It turns. It may be sunny when you rob a bank, but it's going to be shitty when you hide in the woods. <laughs> it's yeah. another saying. That's anything's a euphemism if you put a little twang on it. But yeah, can you imagine being in the woods not shot and, and full yeah. of food sucks. Mm-hmm. But having been shot, it's cold, it's rainy, you're hungry. You've been driving around in a 15 different fucking cars. <laughs> <laughs> well, and you just feel like jail is fine. I will yeah, take jail. I'll, Thank I'll, you. I'll, I'll go to jail, please. I just want a hot meal and get out of these clothes. Sinisterhood will be right back. The holidays are almost over and the new year is around the corner. We all deserve a little peace and quiet in 2021. And there is no better way to manage all the stresses and ring in what has to be a better year than with a CBD routine from Charlotte's Web, the world's most trusted hemp extract. And now you can use the code CREEPY for 15% off their entire selection of amazing products, excluding bulk products and bundles. You can choose from a selection of topical skincare products, gummies, and traditional oils, all made to support you day-to-day, moment-to-moment. I've tried several of their hemp oils, including my personal fave, the mint chocolate. And who doesn't love mint and chocolate? I'm watching, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm, all I do is watch Great British Bake Off. <laughs> they Tommy, need to put this in their Yes, cookies. Tommy looked at um, my Netflix history and he was, literally every show is like, continue watching is just Great British Bake Off, Holiday Edition, Great British <laughs> Bake Off, Dairy Girls Edition. It's just, and they use Everyone. mint and chocolate all the time, which there you go they gotta mix it in everyone loves it it's the perfect flavor combo and it also helps me feel calm and manage my everyday stresses well it sounds delicious well i love the cbd medic eczema therapy medicated ointment because we're headed into january which is traditionally my crustiest month it is so (laughs) dry outside my hands kill me the eczema kills me it's itchy it's flaky it's terrible well this medicated ointment smells great and as soon as i put it on i get relief from all of the itching which is so much worse in the winter The great thing about Charlotte's Web is all their products are free of eight major allergens, not tested on animals, gluten-free, and their topical products are formulated without synthetic fragrances, artificial colors or dyes, sulfates, or GMOs. Speaking of animals, Charlotte's Web even offers products to support your pets. Kate and Biddy in 2021 have decided um, they are going to uh, run for office. Yes. We need them. So, we need their leadership. Yes. Um, and not, they don't want to oust Biden. They just want to be added to the campaign. The yeah, yeah. I get my CNN alerts every day. And um, I'm just waiting for Biden announces he is uh, elected Biddy to be the chief dog of, I don't know. Probably National Parks. No, that'd Biddy be a likes good to one. run. And then Kate can be on the, are we still having Space Force? Is that going to be a thing? But she went to the space station last That's time, true. so maybe. She could be, space. whatever they're going to do, they're going to be great at it because the CBT chews for senior dogs have helped enhance their brain function and support their central nervous system. And Charlotte's Web also offers free shipping and handling on all orders over $25. So say goodbye to 2020 by treating yourself to the world's most trusted hemp extract and go to charlottesweb.com, enter code CREEPY for 15% off today. Henry Helms, Robert Hill, and Marshall Ratliff were each charged with murder, bank robbery, and car theft. Helms attempted to claim insanity, but was sentenced to death for his crimes. He was executed by electric chair on September 6, 1929. Hill was given 99 years in prison. Not wanting to accept his fate, he attempted to escape on three separate occasions. Each time, he was recaptured and sent back. After serving over 20 years, Hill was paroled. He went on to live a law-abiding life in West Texas until his death in 1996. He claimed to have later made friends with Woody Harris, the young boy whose car the gang attempted to steal. What a world. (laughs) First of all, that he escaped three times and they still paroled him and let him go. Yeah, that's crazy. I mean, uh, how are you getting out three times? Texas prisons back then seemed like somebody just leaves a gate open. You could just crawl out a window. It didn't seem yeah, the bars are quite pre- far apart. Yeah, <laughs> something was going on. The keys were always just like a little too Out. close to where you could get them. But you know what? Good for you, Woody Harris, for being like, befriend your foes. 
you I'm know, make peace. I'm gonna, and plus, yes. he was probably traumatized by Santa, and Robert Hill was not Santa. They mm-hmm. also, I mean, he was the youngest of the gang, and everyone said he was very baby faced and had a sweet face. So maybe he wasn't. By the time he got out, I guess he spent about forty years in the in the old slammer. That by the time he got out, he you know was a changed man and mm-hmm. was ready to live his life. I believe he changed his name. He lived under a different name to escape. It's also a cool story if you're Woody Harris. If you're like, yeah, when I for was sure. fourteen. And then later, now I'm friends with the man. We played poker on Thursday Uh nights at uh the VFW. On January 27th, 1928, Ratliff was also sentenced to 99 years in prison for armed robbery. Then, despite no one being able to testify that they actually saw him fire a gun in the bank, Ratliff was sentenced to death on March 30th, 1928, for the deaths of Chief Bedford and Officer Carmichael. In I'd have to go and see the evolution of Texas criminal code since the 20s, but nowadays it's felony murder because you people died in the course of your commission of a felony. So, eh, like it's even though you're not the one that shot them, too bad, so sad. You shouldn't have been committing the felony. Is the public policy reason behind felony murder? Although in Texas you cannot get sentenced to death for felony murder, so things were loose in the 20s. Yeah, yeah. Oh, they were using the electric chair still for sure. Yeah. They were loose. It is interesting that the other ones didn't also get tried for that. Yeah, I mean Henry. With that, since they nobody like we don't know the citizens shooting in. They didn't know who was shooting out. Yeah, and that's so Henry did. I mean Henry Helms. That's why he was executed too. Was for mm-hmm. the murders. Uh, I think, again, Robert had a baby face and maybe rolled on some people. But in theory, they didn't do a lot of bullet analysis back then. Who's to say a citizen didn't shoot exactly. one of them? Yeah. Um. So that's and that's the really sad thing is that, you know, it wasn't like, OK, the cops ambushed and all the citizens hit the floor. It was just a, a swarm of bullets. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, at the end of the day, Ratliff and his gang caused those that swarm, and That's so true. they really caused yes. the chief's death. So I don't, I, oh, maybe not. If death. not for them, Chief Bedford and Officer Carmichael would not have been down at the bank having to yes. defend the bank and all of this. So yeah, they were the proximate cause of their mm-hmm. death at the very least. Just after Helms was executed via electric chair in early September, Ratliff began acting strange and claimed he was insane and paralyzed. He refused to speak only mumbling incoherent sounds. Assuming he was faking it, jailers would position his body at bedtime, then check in the morning to see whether he had moved. He never did. His mother requested a lunacy hearing before the court in Huntsville, Texas, where the state prison was, and still is, located. However, the residents of Eastland County weren't having it. Feeling the pressure from the citizens, the judge extradited Ratliff to the Eastland County Jail. He committed to the bit. They said they stood him up. They stood him upright and they dropped him and he fell on his face yeah. and he didn't flinch and he didn't put his hands up to stop himself that he ragdolled and hit himself, hit, hit his head on the ground. He's pulling an Edward Norton. He told, I mean, he's method. Can you, mm-hmm. can, I could not remember how someone positioned me and I definitely don't have the wherewithal to completely sit still all night, but it was interesting how his insanity began shortly after he saw mm-hmm. they were not fucking around and they killed helms mm-hmm. what is that movie with edward norton damn it fight club fight club no the one Death where to he Spucci. the one I'm where just gonna he yell uh, edward norton movies. the one where he fakes the whole thing um uh in uh, oh, being... is it the one i um i know exactly what you're talking about and at the end, he's like, it was me the whole time. I can't remember. It's Ke- not Kevin Spacey, but I know exactly what you're talking about. Son he's- of a bitch. I mean, we both have computers and we're choosing not to look this <laughs> up. Because we're- it's so rewarding when you when you, when you figure it out on your it? own, when it clicks in your brain. Oh, I almost had it. Oh my God, everyone's screaming right now. My grandmother would say, go through the alphabet. Oh, I do that when I'm trying to remember people's names. Oh, yeah, the same. What same. is it? Did you? Oh, I thought you found it. Oh, I looked it up, but I'm looking it up right now. Hold on. Oh, I just had it again. I want you, I want you to get it. Oh, why thank does, you. Why does Edward Norton filmography have its own Wikipedia page? Oh, I got it. <laughs> Tell me what it starts with. P. Primal Fear. Done. Nice. Ding, 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 ding. Not as good as if I totally got it on my own, but still a bit rewarding. Scratch that itch. That movie is so fucking good. It's Richard Gere, not Kevin Spacey. Richard Gere, yeah. And I'm Richard sorry Gere. if you haven't seen it, but Jesus Christ, it's been out for like 20 something years. Yes, yeah, we have no. It was 1996. I so. think the limitations of spoilers has 
is up. But that movie is so good. Earlier when you said Edward Norton, I just thought you meant he was like a method actor. I forgot uh, about that movie. Oh. <laughs> I was like, oh, yeah, he's just method. I think he's great. <laughs> he's a great I, actor. I have yeah. not heard anything to... Anytime now I say... I, well, because I'm always like... Anytime I say somebody's great, if I haven't gone through, scoured the internet to see if anything's happened, then I'm like, yeah. well, now we're going to get an email about why <laughs> we shouldn't like you Edward Norton. Like Edward Norton is a dick for the following reasons. I'm like, God damn it. I so can't keep just up. full disclosure, if he's done something untoward or was part of a movement that we, we don't support, <laughs> yeah. then I apologize. I don't know. But yeah. as far as his acting chops, great. Yeah, I do try to keep a, a running list in my head, but sometimes it's really it's too hard long to keep now. Up. It's way it's too long. No, so how, who has anybody supposed to keep up with it? You can't. But yeah, the, much like Edward Norton, the uh, Ratliff committed to the bit and, to the very end. I mean, I guess if you have nothing else to do and it's your life on the line, you're dug in, man. And his mom was fully supportive and was like, my son's got something wrong with them. When they had him in court, he would mumble like s the same few phrases over and over again and wouldn't make eye contact and would kind of stare off. And the kind of problem is if you're going to go in front of a lunacy hearing, which is an unfortunate term for it, they will have a doctor examine you. And it's like he had a hodgepodge of symptoms that aren't really all, you know, it's not like, oh, he has, you know, he's gone catatonic. It was various behaviors um what is it on seinfeld when george's arm is moving and the doctor goes i think you're faking it <laughs> like, they're gonna get the doctor in there and have him go i think you're making it up yeah it's not a real thing that but you it's have. also he's he's exhibiting symptoms that one can't really argue with because you're like well i mean he won't speak that doesn't seem like anything is wrong with mm -hmm. him like that we can see mm -hmm. but who are we to say that he is uh, there isn't something wrong you know the fucked up part is that the, if let's for a we'll, we'll see it was a ruse, but let's for a moment pretend it was legitimate. The jailers dropped him on his face. <laughs> yeah. yeah, they they didn't. They had, how else are you going to know? It's like, how do you know if a cell phone is going to pass the test unless you, you drop throw it, it off the building to see if it cracks? <laughs> throw it off the roof. Mm -hmm. In his new cell, Ratliff continued to feign insanity and paralysis. The jailers fully believed it and would bathe him, feed him, and even take Ratliff to the bathroom. They would soon learn, though, that it was all an act. On the night of November 18, 1929, a jailer accidentally left a cell door open. Ratliff, suddenly mobile, took off out of his cell and grabbed a pistol from a nearby desk, knocking a bullet loose in the process. On his way out of the jail, he held another jailer at gunpoint and demanded the keys. The two fought, and Ratliff shot the man five times. A second jailer emerged and also fought Ratliff for the gun. Successfully taking the pistol away from Ratliff, the jailer pointed the gun at the fallen Santa and pulled the trigger. However, because the sixth bullet had been knocked out of the gun, Ratliff lived. Sadly, the first jailer involved in the chaos was not as lucky and eventually died from his injuries. Isn't that so wild that he, he didn't even take the bullet out purposefully. He was just grabbing it and mm -hmm. knocking it around and it happened to save his life. Yeah. It's also... Maybe don't leave a cell door open. I don't know. Like, but he committed to this bit for so long, knowing that at some point there was going to be a window and he yeah. was going to have to take it. And he was on his toes, man. Mm -hmm. As soon as the, he saw that window, boom, he went for it. I wonder, too, if they thought because these mm -hmm. these jailers were nice and were bathing him and lifting him. And if they thought it's fine if you leave the door open because he's paralyzed, yeah. like what do we really care? Exactly. But if you were really sneaky, what you would have done is have like a net on the other side and leave the cell door open. And then when he jumps up to run out, you catch him in the net and be like, gotcha, bitch. A we giant knew you net. weren't yes. the whole needed, time. They needed we a giant were, net. <laughs> you faker. Uh, don't all prisons have giant nets? I think catch? so. I mean, okay. the, in the cartoons they do. So I imagine that they do. <laughs> Yeah, in the 20s. I've been watching the new Animaniacs, so that's my frame of reference. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Upon hearing of the news, the next day nearly 2,000 citizens descended on the jail. Avenging the jailer's death, they dragged Ratliff from his cell, tying his hands and feet, and proceeded towards an empty lot beside the local theater. The mob attempted to hang Ratliff from a power pole, but the rope broke. Undeterred, one citizen headed to the hardware store for something stronger. The second attempt with the new rope worked. According to the book Santa Claus Bank Robbery, a true crime saga in Texas by Twee Snyder, as he was strung up, Ratliff's last words were, 
Forgive me, boys. The crowd then hung him 15 feet in the air, where he died at 9.55 p.m. on November 19, 1929. Though a grand jury was formed, no one was ever tried in connection with the lynching. There's a lot to unpack here. <laughs> yeah. Well, they over overpowered a jailer, allegedly, or did the jailer just be like, I, I mean, think they, do what you gotta do. I think do. he left the door open again. So those doors, are got, they're swinging both ways mm -hmm. in the old jail. They said they they stripped him naked, so he was naked, but for a sack on his head. That the theater the red Idaho potatoes, That's the potato sack. <laughs> the adjacent theater was having a play put up called The Noose, which is just such a wow. weird coinky dink. Also, the rope broke, so they all stood there while <sighs> someone went, went to, to the, the hardware, hardware store. store. Yeah. Did they? Did they buy it at the hardware store, or do you go in and you'd be like, "Hey, I need some rope," and then you explain what it's for? And the hardware owner's like, hell yeah. Here I you bet go. the hardware store wasn't that far from where this is taking place. And if a mob has formed, let him have stringing it. Stringing someone up, they know they're coming. They had the rope at the ready when the guy walked in saying he needed a new rope. But also, much like with the shooting and the cops are just like encouraging people to kill bank robbers, no one was ever tried for this. They, no. And I th I believe they hung him at like nine thirty, and it took him like twenty something yeah. minutes to go. And I just I wonder, as a member of the crowd, the if you feel because I know it's easy to get hyped up in a crowd mentality, a mob mentality. Mm -hmm. If you're like, get him, get the, the, which freaks me out. A mob mentality is one of the scariest things to me because it's there's no rationalization, there's no reason. But no. I wonder after he's gone. And the crowd begins to disperse if you're not forced then to go home and look at yourself in the mirror and be mm. like, oh, God, I was one of those people that did that. Or who knows? Maybe they were like, hell yeah, I did what was right, you know, and it's just like totally wrapped up in their own beliefs. But I wonder once like this, the spell of the mob mentality is broken, if there is a sense of remorse. Once the adrenaline's gone, I'm sure there's yeah. a little bit from column A and a little bit from column B. Yeah. It's like and when you get into... If you're mad at someone yeah, and you, in the heat of the moment, say something that might in the moment feel good because you mm -hmm. get something off your chest and you hurt that person and, yeah. you know, and that's what, that was your intention. At the moment, it feels good. But then once you've calmed down and you look back on it, you're filled with regret. Mm -hmm. You wish you could go back. You can't undo those things. So it wasn't worth it. You know, yeah. what have I done? Yeah. That's just, to, it's so, and granted, Texas has a long as much of the south and the united states a long and sad history of lynchings and of these mob situations and it's just the the psychology behind it is mm -hmm. sc at once scary and also fascinating of why people get and i think you see it today with like political rally you know when people get oh, so yeah. whipped up and and riled up that there's no reason and almost the anonymity of a mob that you're just another person you know, standing shoulder to shoulder, they're not going to, you know, I watched the new Borat movie and it's like that where oh, yeah. I think I the, pe the safety of people in a crowd yelling certain things because they don't think they can be singled out. So it's, it's a interesting mentality. A mob I think, mentality. I think 2020 has shown us a lot about mob mentality, mm -hmm. maybe more than any other year for sure. protest and, um, the election and just, you know, uh, all that kind of stuff. There's definitely, safety in numbers air yeah. quotes as far as their mindset holler and at me holler at us on the show if you got a book about like the the mentality of being in a crowd i'd love to read almost like a malcolm gladwell i need something to digest i don't want a book like a psychology book but like you know i don't want like a <laughs> textbook but i'd love to hear like a pop you know a pop science kind of thing on why people feel that way i don't know i think i recently read an article maybe out of the new york times mm. about that yeah, I feel like a quick Google search will yeah, I'll find give us something. some good good answers there. But it is definitely scary. And to be him and to have just a mob of people wanting you dead, you're like, well, there's no way I'm getting out of this. No, uh -uh. as much as you've escaped before, you're mm -hmm. by far outnumbered. Even though the jail is right there with mm -hmm. police officers. That's the scarier thing, too. Of like, mm -hmm. you're in charge. And at, at that point, no, they're not. No. No, they're not. The next day, thousands of people came out to view Ratliff's corpse that had been displayed at a local furniture store. His mother then took her son's body and had him buried at Olivet Cemetery in Fort Worth. 
that's another weird thing is back then they would as like a point of pride so everyone could come see like Mm -hmm. look at the good work you did we're gonna set up his dead body at a furniture store yeah just lay him out on a couch and then do you think they sold the couch and then we're gonna yeah probably for, for more, more than what or they less. had <laughs> that's a good point it's People technically like murderabilia. used yeah yeah it's murderabilia yeah mm-hmm. that's it's that's weird psyche that it is sick yeah. kind of yeah to this day the robbery of the first national bank in cisco texas remains one of the most infamous crimes the state has ever seen famed texas columnist boy's house who witnessed the entire thing wrote that it was the most spectacular crime in the history of the southwest surpassing any in which billy the kid or the james boys had ever figured according to texas escapes while it is unsurprisingly a new building the bank still stands and even features a large mural of the robbery and newspaper clippings and pictures of the many people that were involved for the small town of cisco it has become a point of pride something forever ingrained in their folklore in 1967 the organization now known as the Texas Historical Commission even placed a medallion on the bank commemorating the robbery, according to the Texas State Historical Association. Yeah, they got a plaque on there and everything. Go They're proud visit. of it, man. Everything's man. bigger in Texas. I guess so. Including, <laughs> including our pride for bank robberies that happened in the small towns where we live. Yeah, because they said, you know, if you grew up in small towns in Texas— Sometimes you don't leave. You're born there, and that's where mm-hmm. where you die there, too. So for a lot of these residents, they, you know, they were there, or it gets passed down over generations of, like, Grandma was down at the bank the day Santa came in and robbed it. So it becomes, like, this story in their family that they're, that they're proud of, and it's fun to tell. And it's true. And even, like, Emma Roberts, Emma Mae Robertson, she was only 10, and she mm-hmm. testified, you know, and told them everything that happened. So I'm sure for years, you know, people wanted to hear her story. And there's a couple of interviews online with residents that were very elderly in the 80s to 90s when the interviews were filmed that were like, I was five years old at the mm-hmm. time. And, like, they all – it's funny because – what do you remember from when you were five, right? Like, not a yeah, lot. No. Would you remember this because it was? Or would you just have a vague under, like vague memory of, like, a crowd and stuff? But it's just funny people that were really little at the time, you know, that lived into the 80s and 90s and, and beyond were like, I remember vividly the day Santa robbed the bank. And it's like, there's no way. <laughs> you know. I don't but, know. I, I have a terrible memory. So I can't really even remember, was I five when something happened? Mm. Or, like, I might have a memory and if I told my mom this is what I remember, she could be like, oh, yeah, you were five when that happened. Mm-hmm. But I have no concept of how old I was. But I have friends and my brother can remember shit like back to when they were four or five easily. But it's a good question of if something like this that's so monumental happens, it's probably more likely to stick in your brain. But also, do you, are you just remembering stories people have told you about it? Or, you know, when you were little, it happened and someone said, like, when I drawn in the ball pit at the, the Chuck E. Cheese, my aunt asked me right then what happened. And then the next day, someone asked me what happened. So then you're remembering the last time you told it, like we mm-hmm. talked about before. So, you know, you, you're you remembering something. It's just a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy. Yep. But is what what re- even is real? What's reality? What's a real Good memory? Good question. I ask myself that every day, Heather. <laughs> so what do we think? Man, again, it's not that you want to ever see the criminals get away with money. But a situation like this, it's just so senseless that they go in, they cause all this chaos, they take all these lives, and there's, for literally, there's no purpose. There's no end. No. Yeah. Idiots. Even if they'd taken the money with them and not left it in the car with Davis, they still inevitably got caught, so it it wouldn't have mattered. Yeah, I can't imagine. This is not Butch Cassidy and Sundance Kid, and they're going to go, who even... Again, that movie was out in the 70s. Spoiler alert. They did, you know, all bank robbers, I think, meet a pretty heinous ending. But you think, okay, I'm going to take all this money and move to Mexico or take all this money and move to Canada. Maybe they would have, I, I don't think ever, there was not a, an ending of the story ever where they got away just right. based solely upon their yeah uh, inadequacies and stupidities. They did not have the checklist. No, get your checklist. Get man. your checklist. And if three to four robberies are happening a day, yeah, it doesn't even have to be that great of a checklist because clearly people are overwhelmed with bank robberies. Like you started off strong. 
The yeah. Santa the Santa thing was a strong choice. Yeah. <laughs> and then just very quickly, I think honestly, I think a big <laughs> reason they weren't gonna get away with anything was because of the dead robber clause. Oh yeah. You yeah. can't have three people trying to rob a bank in a town of eight thousand that all have guns down at the bank trying to kill them. And especially, it wasn't like they went right when the bank opened or right mm -hmm. when it was fixing to close. They went at 1245 in the afternoon. It was like the most busy part mm -hmm. of the day. So there's a shitload of people around. And when you got the guy that runs the diner with a shotgun in your face, like ready to blast you, there's no way you're going to get out of this successfully. No. Well, they're lucky that they got out alive, frankly. I'm surprised yeah. with that many bullets that it wasn't them that took the bullets. But I think they were using the customers and the workers as human shields and to get in their car yeah in the end it might have been better for them had they met their fate that day yeah especially for ratliff yeah it's a pretty grisly end especially mm -hmm. with the two ropes because you get the mm. time the waiting time in between yeah that's rough and it would have been better for the jailer that he killed yeah well if you lived in cisco um i won't say when this happened because who knows about our demo probably aren't alive <laughs> I would imagine. Eh, just barely. Probably wouldn't remember it. But you know what? If you were and you know how to listen to podcasts, please email us because I'm <laughs> we love very you. impressed and I, I do want to meet you. Yeah. But if you currently live in Cisco and I'm sure you know about this and stuff, uh, let us know. Let us know what, what everybody's saying about this down there. I always like when you know, people message us and be like, my grandma was there. Like, my mm -hmm. grandpa was the sheriff or whatever. So, yeah. Send oh, us someone story. emailed us today that their dad is best friends with uh, Bob Giblin. Oh, look at that. And sent pictures. Of that the picture, of, the picture you chose for the social media post of Bob Giblin. Look at that outfit. I mean, he is sharp. <laughs> He's Remember a rodeo the cowboy foot. through and through. Oh, Once yeah. a rodeo cowboy, always a rodeo cowboy. Oh, it's something that you're born with. Like, yeah. you don't grow into it. It show The rodeo cowboy life chooses you. Yes, yeah, it's true. Yes. That's hilarious that they're friends. I mm -hmm. love that. Yeah, we yeah. love a good personal connection. Always, always. We love providing Sinister to you at no cost, so if you like what you hear, consider supporting the show by donating to our Patreon. We're a small operation, creating the show for you by researching, writing, recording, and producing it ourselves. Any amount is sincerely appreciated and helps offset the cost of making and hosting the show. As a thank you, you'll also get some sweet perks like ad-free episodes, a Sinisterhood sticker, membership to our exclusive Patreon Facebook group for those in the Rolling the Airwaves tier, a special shout out on the show, a monthly bonus mini sode, and patron exclusive audio and video content, including fun new additions we added in, just like our wheel episodes, where we spin an actual game show wheel and talk about topics that you guys have sent to us. You also have the fun perk of access to our Discord server, where you can connect with other fans in real time and discuss the latest in true crime, share personal ghost stories, or just post adorable pictures of your pets. We'll also be hopping on occasionally and hosting monthly Q&As where you can ask us all your burning questions. For our patrons not in the U.S., you now have the option to pay in pounds or euros, saving you the cost of conversion fees. Annual memberships for tiers are also now available. Those that select this option will be rewarded with a free month of membership. For more details on all of this and specific member tiers, visit Sinisterhood.com and click Patreon on the top banner. And make sure you stick around after our sign-offs to hear your shout-out. So many of you have been tagging us in pictures of you sporting your sweet Sinisterhood merch. Keep those pictures coming. We have very cozy, lovely, wintry stuff for you to buy in the shop, including beanies, hoodies, and long sleeve tees. So if you want to get some cool Sinisterhood swag like t-shirts, mugs, totes, and even clothes for your kiddos, visit Sinisterhood.com and click on Shop on the top banner. The best thing you can do to help us grow is like, review, and subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to your podcasts. And please tell a friend who you think would like us to check us out. It means so much to us and really helps small podcasts like us get more exposure. You can follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Sinisterhood Pod and like us on Facebook at Sinisterhood Christy. Yes. And we don't ever talk about how on our social media we post, uh, you mentioned them a second ago, we post pictures mm -hmm. of whatever episode we release that week that are of interest. And 
we also post our favorite quotes from the episodes. Yeah. yeah. And we, we do little clips from the show. And then Christy always amasses some excellent photos that go along with it. So we talked about Bigfoot last time. Mm-hmm. So our actual photos. This one will have, I'm sure, pictures of the perps that did it in the Santa Claus <laughs> outfit. That the, Oh, yes. I love the uh, wanted picture that they used, which was just a stock picture of Santa. <laughs> um, and also, when uh, we send out Patreon envelopes, we send a little behind the scenes video. So it has all kinds of fun stuff on our yes. stories. Plus, you get most up to date information on all the stuff that's happening for the show it's the best way uh for us to make announcements to you yes absolutely as far as personal social media you can follow me on instagram at christy m wallace and on twitter at christy or gtfo heather i'm on twitter at mck versus the world and on instagram at heather versus the world as always the devil rules the airwaves keep it creepy Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for supporting the show on Patreon. Here are your special Patreon shout outs. Carrie Merkerson. Marie Smith. Audrey Erickson. Jess Law. Brittany Dominguez. Rhiannon JP. Alex Empire. Kaylee Fielder. Melissa Baum. Juliana. Taylor Koshak. Sarah Balding. Melody Ross. Aaron Jones. Maddie Strobel. Savannah Bailey. Stacey Lynn Hunt. Thank you guys so much for supporting the show. We couldn't do this without you. We sincerely appreciate it, especially during these trying times. We hope you have a very merry holiday season. Stay safe, stay healthy, and keep it creepy. Sinister.